wants that you have put on my heart through the message of <coughs> me this evening. So has someone ever told you something so outrageous and unbelievable that the only way you could possibly believe what they said would be for you to experience it yourself. Then, if you saw or experienced that outrageous or unbelievable idea, would you allow them to change your life in this way? That's where the disciples have been since those first reports that the tomb was empty. Our Gospel reading from Luke this morning is the last of three instances when Jesus appears to his followers in that Gospel. Some women, Simon Peter, Clopas, and an unnamed disciple have reported to the others that they have seen Jesus. All of the disciples may not have immediately believed when others told, believed that Jesus was truly alive when the others told them that he was. Some of them may have thought he was a spiritual being, like an angel, who looked human but didn't have real flesh. And others may have thought that while Jesus had been human, the resurrection was about spiritual presence, a vision, and not about him rising from the tomb. Jesus' followers needed two things. First, they needed to grasp the reality of his resurrection. The risen Lord is no ghost or apparition but neither is the one who stands before them merely a resuscitated corpse. Resurrected life is embodied existence. The second thing they had to comprehend was how Jesus, though despised and humiliated among the people, has been exalted, has an exalted status before God. Our gospel reading from Luke 24, 36 through 48, Jesus, has, Jesus achieves both of these corrections. The body of the risen Jesus Christ was a real body. Oh, no one saw him come into the room, so they might have thought that it was another vision. But when Jesus asked them for something to eat, the vision or a ghost becomes a real person because visions and ghosts don't eat like humans do. And secondly, and perhaps even more importantly, in verse 45, Jesus does something that is quite extraordinary. He opens the minds of his disciples <coughs> to understand the scriptures. He helps them to understand the point of everything he has done. Why he died. Why he rose again. And what's going to happen next. He sums it all up in two very important verses. Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day. And the repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. Verses 46 and 47. By showing his, his followers that his body is real and opening their minds to the scriptures, Jesus was preparing them to be witnesses to what has happened and then enabling them to carry that good news to the rest of the world. Next, we turn our attention to Peter's sermon in Acts chapter 3, verses 12 through 19. 
This is the perfect example of witnessing to the world of Jesus. Peter does exactly what Jesus commands him and us to do. Simply put, he bears witness to these things. He does this right after he and John have healed a crippled beggar. The crowd was surprised. But Peter says to them, don't be surprised by this, for it was done in the name of Jesus. And then he says to them, you killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. Peter doesn't say anything fancy. He doesn't twist any of the truth. He just provides plain truth. Your sins put Jesus on the cross, but God raised him from the dead. Repent, therefore, and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped out. That's the core of the good news of Jesus Christ. That's what we're called to proclaim to all nations. And there is nothing we can do that's more important. Of course, John, the disciple who was the disciple who was with Peter when the lame man was healed on the side of the temple. And he expressed his new understanding with Peter before the crowd that day and later in his letter. 1 John 3, 1 through 7. John proclaims that believers are made God's children as a result of God's love demonstrated in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He understands that by faith in Jesus Christ, we become children of God, living daily in God's presence and bearing the family trait of God's family, which is holiness. God's children are free from sin and live their lives in God's love, which is the perfect way that we would all like to live, free of sin and in the light of God's love. John and Peter and the other followers of Jesus encountered the real flesh and blood resurrected Jesus Christ in person. Those encounters opened their minds, changed their lives, and led them to continue the message of Jesus Christ, not only from Jerusalem, but to the entire world, not only then, but for centuries beyond them. Unfortunately, we weren't with the disciples on that first Easter evening. We're not blessed to be the actual witnesses to these things in that same, in the same way that they were. We don't get to see the risen Jesus. We don't get to touch him or have him open our minds to scriptures. The first disciples shared what they learned. They opened the minds of others. And what they learned was eventually written down. And we are blessed to be able to read their inspired words in what we call the Holy Scriptures. And the Holy Scriptures have helped us to open our minds as well. We're blessed to be invited again today to turn from whatever we are placing our ultimate hope and trust in, turn to the place that is with our risen Lord, Jesus Christ. And then, of course, we're invited to go and bear witness to these things, to proclaim Jesus' message, that simple and clear message. Christ has died for all. Christ was raised for all. And Christ will come again for me and you and for all. 
Thanks be to God for this most important of all messages. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we're called to carry that out into our modern day world and let everyone else know that Christ, though he died, was raised and he will come again for each and every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen.